to you. Well, hello. I'm Greg Stone, and we're here at TCT Asia Pacific 2019, and I'm here with my great friend uh, S.J. Park, who organizes, again, one of the most important conferences in Asia, and with two of the luminaries in the field, also good friends, Antonio Colombo and John Ormiston. And we just came out of a, a really exhilarating session where we talked about all the intricacies of multivessel disease and left main treatment, particularly deciding between PCI and bypass surgery, what the predictors are in the contemporary era of long-term outcomes, and then specifically a lot of the technical expertise, particularly how to manage complex bifurcation disease. So we're going to review some of the highlights from this session and have a further and even more in-depth discussion on some of the nuances of these points here. Mm -hmm. So, so let me start. Maybe uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with multivessel disease because it's kind of become evident that uh, um, the long-term outcomes after PCI and surgery for multivessel disease versus left main disease are somewhat different. Um, we used to think that left main disease, that was for surgery, and we could handle multivessel disease as interventionalists, and now we've actually learned that we probably do even better with left main disease than complex multivessel disease. So let's first talk about multivessel disease. So which kind of cases of multivessel disease should be treated by PCI? Which should be treated by surgery? What are the determinants of outcomes in those two settings? How do we let patient decisions enter into that calculus? Uh, what have we learned from a lot of the new studies that have come out and some of the meta-analyses? Who would like to start? Maybe SJ, t t tell me how at the Sun Medical Center, when you have a patient with complex uh, uh, multivessel disease, mm -hmm. how do you decide PCI versus surgery? Right, that is uh, basically, <clears throat> you know, guideline concern is, uh, you know, very limited. Uh, just uh, a low synthetic tosology, we're gonna treat them for that. As, however, uh, I would uh, show some slide in practical guideline concern, just yeah. you mentioned that our practical, in the, our practice, as we did, uh, functionally significant uh, vessels mm -hmm. and feasible for PCI. Uh, right. Actually, as Antonio mentioned about the, what is a feasible concern. Right. However, feasible for PCI, we can do that. And uh, lastly, we have to uh, consider complete revascularization. And feasible PCI, multivessel disease, and complete uh, revascularization uh, uh, would be okay. Uh, However, it's infeasible, it's unfavorable anatomy in terms of PCI, very right. long diffuse disease, right. et cetera, calcified lesion. So I send the patient to the surgery right. uh, quickly. So uh, which lesion actually uh, we can define the feasible, you know, favorable anatomy for PCI. And so based on our uh, data, IVS data, angiographic data, so I would say kind of a big vessel, at least the QCA dominance is more than two five, and the reason length less than 50 millimeters. Actually, we can treat uh, just a long drill to stand 40 something, 40 millimeters, something like that. And so, uh, reason uh, would be big vessel, reason length is less than 50 millimeters, you're gonna treat. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, consider about the uh, effective standing areas, you know, more than 5.5 and 5 millimeter scales, I think is enough. And so, uh, that is our, you know, practical yeah. principles in terms of way. So, so you know, brought up a very important point, and that is the ability to achieve complete revascularization. Right, right. And there's more and more data mm -hmm. that um, PCI with complete revascularization, mm -hmm. probably particularly complete ischemic revascularization, right, exactly, ischemic right. or anatomic, yeah. those patients may do, and I say may, because mm -hmm. there's no randomized trials, but may do as well as surgery. Yeah. Uh, where if yes. you have incomplete revascularization mm -hmm. after PCI, they certainly have a worse prognosis, and many studies have yeah. shown that. Right. So let, let me go to John. So um, John, you know the guidelines right now in Europe are fairly stringent, and they suggest multivessel disease patients with a syntax score of greater than 22 should have surgery. Um, even intermediate syntax score patients should have surgery, but they don't take into account some of these more nuanced things of the complexity of the disease, whether the operator believes they'll be able to get complete or incomplete revascularization, patient preferences, etc. Nonetheless, there's a class three guideline indication for PCI, meaning it's almost malpractice. So in, in your practice and, and with your colleagues, how do you take in the patient with moderate to more complex multivessel disease some of these considerations into account? 
Well, I think it's um, all about, as you say, complete revascularization. And if you can completely revascularize, and you think there's a low chance of complications because the lesions are not too long, the vessels are you know, of reasonable caliber. And also the other uh, big thing is whether the patient's diabetic or not. Right. And so um, I think you take each patient individually and you look at each lesion individually and think if you can get a good result in all of these lesions and, it's, and if, especially if the patient's not diabetic. Yeah, so, so we did a, a collaborative individual patient data pooled analysis of all the cabbage versus drug eluting stent randomized trials, almost 12,000 randomized patients. And among the left main disease patients, there was no difference in mortality out to five years, regardless of diabetes or no diabetes mm -hmm. uh, or syntax score. In the multivessel disease patients, in the non-diabetics, there was no difference in mortality. But in the diabetics, there was a substantial difference in mortality. So I would agree with you. Um, you know, bypass surgery does seem to be associated with a reduction in long-term MI rates, and that's probably going to be particularly in diabetics with diffuse disease. So Antonio, you're the master of, of complete revascularization. So who in your practice do you primarily refer to surgery as opposed to PCI? And how much do you take patient preferences into account? Okay, uh, I think uh, first of all, uh, you have to take into consideration the quality of the surgery you have in yeah. your center. I mean, we always uh, talk about surgery as a one-to-one, -one, uh, but uh, if you have a diffuse disease LAD, we know that we don't like to stand over 50 millimeter, mm -hmm. but uh, you have to talk with the surgeon and really understand where he's gonna place the graft. Right. If the surgeon is gonna place uh, the lima in the very distal LAD, right. I'm gonna think twice. Uh, if he's not going to do anything to the right because the PDA is too small uh, and you end up with uh, uh, one mammary in the red distal LED, that's uh, uh, a minimalistic approach, uh, too minimalistic. So I think uh, the surgical quality and the surgical willingness uh, to achieve uh, a good revascularization uh, and uh, in addition, uh, I want to go back to the issue of diabetes. I think diabetes is important, but should not be considered such a dichotomous. Uh, when I, sometimes I see an 85-year-old gentleman or lady who is diabetes, I, I wish to become diabetic at 85. <laughs> I mean, they have uh, three, four collisions. Uh, right. You can place uh, uh, two stents, 3.5, one stent, 3 or 15 millimeter. Right. I have no hesitation mm -hmm. to suggest uh, PCI. So on the other hand, uh, if you see a diabetic with long LAD uh, that uh, has a reasonable distal target or even an LAD total occlusion or a, uh, a instant restenosis, a long diffuse instant restenosis in a diabetic, you know you're gonna reopen, but you know that the long diffuse instant yeah. restenosis of the LAD in a diabetic, the chance to recur are high. So I think... Uh, yeah, and that, that, that's a great point, and I couldn't agree with you more. And it, it, it brings to mind the fact that in the syntax trial, when you looked at what the factors were that differentiated between PCI and cabbage outcomes, age was a factor, sex was a factor, syntax score was a factor, uh, renal insufficiency was a factor, diabetes was not a factor mm -hmm. after doing multivariable analysis. So if you control for the diffuseness of the disease, it would, you know, primarily reflected in the syntax score and other factors, if you're lucky enough to get a diabetic with a couple focal lesions, those patients are going to do very well with PCI. It's just that they more often have diffuse, complex disease, renal insufficiency, et cetera. I think it's also, comorbidities will influence our decision making too. If a patient has a lot of comorbidities and is very old, then we'll tend to think about PCI no matter what. Right. So, so how do we take patient preferences into account? 
Uh, we know there's such a huge difference between the periprocedural morbidity of PCI versus surgery. And I think that's what a lot of patients think about when you offer them these two choices. Uh, um, and even if there are relatively small differences, I mean, if, if you were to tell a patient, we're going to give you a one or two in a hundred chance of living another five years, but to do that, we have to run you over with a car. <laughs> okay? And then you'll get over it in a couple months, and then you'll have a one in 200 chance of living a couple, you know, a couple more years. I don't think too many patients are going to want to be run over by a car. And I, 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 I'm using an extreme example, but for many patients, mm -hmm. major surgery seems like a lot to go through. So we're very sensitive about talking to our patients, but we feel it's very important to give them the true picture. They don't have the medical nuance to really understand the magnitude of the differences. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there might be a big difference between surgery and PCI. Other times the differences would be very small. Mm -hmm. So we have to help them, give them the information, but then ultimately it's got to be their choice. Uh, you know, many patients, uh, not all, but a large number of patients, especially uh, in, in my country, uh, don't want to be put with the decision. They ask, mm. what do you suggest? Right. You are the doctor. You are the mm. expert. Mm. Why don't you mm. tell me what is the best? Don't mm. so give who me should, these, so, so great point. So who should tell them? Should it be you? Should it be the surgeon? Should it be a general cardiologist who's not invested in one procedure or the other? Or should it be a heart team coming to a decision and then collectively telling the patient, we think you should have this? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, ideally, should the heart team? Right. Ideally, should the heart team? Uh, because if you make the patient talk to the surgeon and with you, uh, you don't really end up with a confused right. person. Right. I think the heart team uh, should, because the heart team also evaluates the capabilities uh, inside right. the hospital, exactly. and uh, we know. As much as reasonable it is, uh, cross-reference to another institution is not a reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's only a reality if you don't have that service. Right. But uh, if in your institution you have a surgery, you are not going to refer a patient to another hospital because you believe uh, that they have a better surgery. Even no, no, if that will uh, never happen. Even if it's uh, reasonable, this is not mm. going to happen. So I think... Uh, uh, the in-house capabilities uh, are also important. You may have a weak uh, PCI program in your yep, hospital. Absolutely. A Not absolutely. Uh, uh, you have an LED occlusion and the, there is no skills uh, to do a good uh, aggressive reopening uh, and uh, you accept for, uh, for surgery. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And even if they are not big trial on hybrid, uh, maybe in some cases uh, you can mm -hmm. do hybrid. So let's talk a little about left main disease now, because mm -hmm. it, again, it used to be the left main disease was purely the province of the surgeon. The left main supplies 70% or more of the myocardium, mm -hmm. uh, and many attempts, first balloon angioplasty, then bare metal stance, mm -hmm. then first generation drug eluting stance, frustrating results compared to surgery. But now we're getting pretty good results. Mm -hmm. And uh, the syntax trial suggested that in the 700 left main mm -hmm. patient cohort, um, even with tax assistance, that you could get very good outcomes, especially if the syntax score was less than or equal to 32, uh, that is lower intermediate. And in the Excel trial that we led, we found basically very equivalent outcomes up to three years in terms of the hard endpoints of death MI mm -hmm. or stroke. Um, much better early results with PCI, mm -hmm. but better late results with cabbage, so you end up getting to the same place. So how is your thinking, SJ? Uh, at Asan, you do arguably more left main uh, interventions than any place I know of in the world. It's maybe short of a few Fuai in China. But you do have incredible experience with left main PCI. So how has your thinking evolved over the years of mm -hmm. left main PCI versus cabbage? Right. Uh, but any uh, up to this point is based on the, any data. It, it'll be different with uh, the main yeah. disease and multivascular disease, right? And so yeah. I'm really uh, uh, surely consider about the why you know some difference with the multivascular disease. Um, uh, first, uh, at first, uh, the main disease is very uh, feasible for PCI. The main yeah. is very proximal, 
big vessels, you know, mm -hmm. in in case of a simple, you know, the main disease, it's very easy to perform, as, uh, you know. Actually, uh, even Andreas Grunsig thought that. Oh, right, right, he thought right, it's a very right, focal exactly. proximal yeah. lesion. It should be perfect for PCR. Uh, right, for, right. For and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Right. That is f f first. And secondly, as a, in your data, Excel data, as a syntax data, as a, they are, we are uh, challenging uh, to the more complex region subset, right? Mm -hmm. Main with uh, two vessels, three vessels, and we got some issues in terms of, uh, you know, some crossover, separation, et cetera, et cetera, may be related with the uh, uh, remaining, you know, mm -hmm. three multi mm -hmm. almost same issues from the multi disease, right? Mm -hmm. and, Second one, so in terms of efficacy concern, main, TG, main PCR is getting better so based on the hour registries, yeah. on the, uh, you know, it, in terms of uh, stand itself, first generation, second generation, so there is actually no difference at all. The stent different. thrombosis, much, much less. Stent thrombosis right. is getting much better. Right. Right. Agree. Right. Agree. <laughs> but Africa's concern, yeah. actually, based on the our data, as we compare with the side by side from the side from right. Texas, you know, Giants, yeah. Apple, uh, actually, we, based on our data, we didn't find any maze uh, target basal failure or something like that. Yeah. And big changes is, I think, is concept, right? From the beginning, so right. from the Grunzi, he says, uh, uh, try it. Uh, are the main uh, PCI. However, we do kind of a function, so just we mm -hmm. discuss a lot about the uh, image guided, you know, how to treat, how to optimize, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, how to completely vascularization. Right. Those kind of, you know, concept change, concept evolution actually uh, changes, you know, our you know, yeah. current result of the main I think so. So, so. so that's a great great point you bring up mm -hmm. in that our, our technique has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're doing more and more complex right. left mains. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally think the syntax score actually overweights the left main. Right, right. So I don't think, uh, you know, I think a 25 point left main disease mm -hmm. is less severe than a 25 point multivessel disease without left main involvement. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. something we're gonna work on in, on Excel, coming up with an Excel score. So Antonio, I wanted to ask you, um, if you're gonna take on a left main, what are some of the key technical aspects you have to be very good at? 85% of them are distal bifurcations. What about intravascular imaging? What about, uh, you know, adjunct yeah, I mean, pharmacology, FFR, mm -hmm. uh, hemodynamic support? What? Very low threshold to the bulk. Yeah, okay. Especially if you have a complex bifurcation, if you don't modify the plaque on both sides, you're gonna push the disease from one vessel to the other and uh, you will end up uh, with a mediocre result, uh, in, at least in one of the two. So how do we debulk? We don't I, have VCA. I think uh, rotational atherectomy mm -hmm. is, still, uh, uh, is still a reasonable technique. Uh, I am uh, eager uh, to try orbital atherectomy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they are coming to Europe. Yeah. Uh, we really it's have to evaluate nice uh, how it, uh, it performs. Um, cutting balloon and uh, uh, shock wave. These are all the techniques that should uh, be able to help. So optimal lesion preparation yes. is very, very, very important. important. And uh, I keep on telling that the victim of optimal lesion preparation has been uh, the bioresorbable scaffold mm. that uh, yeah. uh, gave their life uh, to at least to demonstrate how important uh, is optimal lesion preparation. Uh, another point that uh, I like to bring up is, um, is the follow-up. Uh, we don't discuss anymore, but uh, patients who had the left main uh, uh, triple vessel disease, uh, four or five stents placed, should only have clinical follow-up uh, or should we programmed after two years, uh, uh, CT scan, no mm -hmm. matter what uh, the symptoms are. And if the CT shows some abnormality, do a, an angiogram. 
Well, as you know, that's a, that would have been great with bioresorbable scaffolds, um, but you've got blooming artifacts with left main. But it's still you know, problematic, we, we even do FFRCT it. We not do yet In my practice, yeah. uh, if I have a patient who has uh, four, five stents, yeah. after two years, he always gets uh, a multi-slice CT. Yeah. And many of them uh, undergo angiography, even if they're right. totally asymptomatic. Because you'll have false and positives. I see, <laughs> I, but I also see sure. true positives. I understand, of course. I see diffuse disease, and uh, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, you can say, you can cause mm. periprocedural MI, but if you treat the right lesion, I think you may mm. prevent uh, well, some MI. It's certainly worth a lot more study, so we no need, doubt about uh, We it. need to understand uh, the, how to follow up this patient because uh, if the mammary is, does not require follow up, stand, long stent on the LAD yeah. needs some kind of follow up and the exercise uh, uh, stress test is not sufficient. Well, so let me step back though before follow up and I want to get both your opinions and then I'm going to go to John. Um, I'll ask a very direct question. Yeah. Should people that don't do intravascular imaging and don't rely on intracoronary physiology, mm -hmm. should they be doing complex multivessel disease and left main PCI? No. No idea about the uh, you mean function and imaging. Right. In other words, if you don't, if you're not an imager, and if you don't right. do FFR to help you or IFR or whatever mm -hmm. other resting indices to help you decide which lesions should be and, and also I was, I should guidance. those people be doing an IVIS guidance or OCT guidance? Mm -hmm. Should those people be doing complex procedures? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, to be honest, I have already, uh, you know, learned lots of things from the, you know, I've guided and even angiographic guided complex disease subset. Uh, I can do just, uh, I mentioned about the favorable, you know, anatomy, feasibility concern mm -hmm. about PCI. If big vessel, I can place the less than 15 millimeters, 10, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to treat, I'm going to treat the PCI. Um, right. However, uh, based on the current data, diabetic patients, you know, uh, low ejection fraction, diffuse disease, calcified regions, uh, I you, don't want to But touch. you do IVIS in like 90, greater yeah, than 90% yeah. of all your cases. Yes. And you do FFR in more than 50% yes. of all your cases. Yes. So you believe in using intracoronary imaging and yes. physiology yes. abundantly. Antonio, you just no. said no. The, uh, unless you are willing to use the full armamentarium of what's available, you can't get the you best cannot. results. And uh, I, I tell you, we are, we are using IVUS uh, quite a lot uh, since a long time. And in doing our experience with uh, bioresorbable, we have used IVUS uh, 100%. Right. And uh, we were very practical. We didn't. Uh, uh, do baseline IVUS if the vessel was clearly 3.5. Right, right, we, right, right. And uh, we didn't do IVUS after uh, scaffold placement. We did port dilatation right, routinely. Right, right. So yeah. we used IVUS in a very smart uh, way. Practical. Despite uh, doing IVUS uh, only after port dilatation at 2022 atmosphere, we needed to do something more. 20% so of the time, one right. out of five. So this tells you that even if you learn a lot by an IVUS trained right. practice, you still not always, but uh, let's say 20% is too much, at least 15% you need to do something And that more. applies to metallic DES as yes. well, especially in complex So I, I think uh, there is a learning curve, but you should not uh, right. So maybe you say I miss 15%, it's not right. so big about that, but you know, I, I like to do excellent job. Absolutely. You can. There's Absolutely. no reason to compromise. And you've got a patient's life in your hands. If you're going to spend 15 or 30 more minutes, I mean, you know, to, to the, give the patient the best chance of living right. a good life, like, gosh, how could you not do that? So John, let me ask you now, 
Um, let's talk about bifurcation disease. And, and let's talk particularly about left main bifurcation disease because, you know, 85% approximately left main disease involves the distal bifurcation. So you've got to be an expert at managing bifurcation disease if you're an interventionalist, particularly if you're going to do left mains. So, so what have you learned from your bench and your clinical studies about the optimal way to approach the distal left main bifurcation? Well, I think, you know, I'm a believer in a provisional strategy. Okay. Uh, and so a lot of bi left mains I do, uh, we get away with uh, just a provisional strategy and we're very happy to do uh, kissing balloon post dilatation and um, only do a, put an additional stent in if we need it. But it's, of, co of course, there's a lot of disease that is uh, too long in the side branch to just be, have a provisional strategy, so you have to go for a, a, a two-stent two strategy from the outset. Okay. So if you do a, if you do a provisional strategy, um, because you think it's a very focal mm -hmm. osteocircumflex lesion or minimal disease in the circumflex. Um, when do you decide to put in a second stent? Are you doing it by angiographic guidance, what your criteria is, by FFR guidance? Wh when do you decide to cross over? Well, in our situation, uh, most of us in our country would do it angiographically. Yeah. Which I'm sure that's not the right. approach that a lot of you guys right. are going to recommend. So, and I'm going to ask all three of you, mm -hmm. so left main bifurcations, what percent will get two stents, either planned or provisional? What percent, approximately? Well, all think, comers, all left main well, bifurcations. I think probably 30%. 30%. Antonio, what do you think? I think maybe 25. About 25? Is that 25 percent? So about 25. Interesting. I was going to say about 40. So I was going to say a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Antonio, um, what, what's, you've done several studies, Cactus and others, um, and you've pointed out that if you do it right, there's really not a downside to putting in two stents. Everyone likes to think the second stent is terrible and, uh, and avoid it at all costs. More periprocedural MI, more late stent thrombosis and restenosis. But if you need it, you need it. And if you do it right with imaging guidance and the right kind of technique, you pay very little price for it. So what, what's your threshold for left main disease putting in a second stent? I, I'm not afraid about thrombosis. Um, Periprocedural MI, you know, every time you place an additional stent, uh, no matter what, you increase the risk yep. of periprocedural MI, especially if you are strict uh, in your uh, evaluation of what you call periprocedural MI. Um, the reason why I am a little bit afraid of two stents uh, is aristenosis. Uh, and uh, we have now drug-coated balloons, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to do a study. We are just uh, collecting uh, data, but we are uh, evaluating a side branch treated with drug-coated balloon, and I'm very eager to see what is the long-term result. Uh, as long as the flow is good, uh, the dissection uh, is benign dissection, mm -hmm. we are more and more uh, willing uh, to leave the side branch with a drug-coated balloon mm -hmm. and not with a stent. And that's because you're concerned about the overlapping layer of metals? Are you concerned? We've talked about this a lot, that the osteocircumflex is very difficult. We think, and the recurrence rate is high. We think the bifurcations uh, have some uh, motion yeah. uh, with the heart beat, and maybe the stent uh, changes uh, the, uh, the coronary flow, uh, the shear stress, uh, uh, so may uh, favor intimal proliferation. Uh, uh, that uh, may not be totally true because I distinctively remember some cases uh, of the Amigo mm -hmm, trial mm -hmm. where we used to do uh, direct uh, right. DCA and uh, with optimal debulking, the follow-up result was excellent. Yeah. But the circumflex stent was really large. Right. And uh, I think uh, uh, five, uh, uh, four uh, square millimeter for the circumflex is, is a little bit uh, too 
yeah. too low. I think for the circumflex, uh, such a nasty vessel, you need seven or eight. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, SJ, you, you've had your five, six, seven, eight rule, mm -hmm. okay? So eight millimeter squared in the left main, seven millimeter squared in the polygon of convergence, uh, six millimeter squared if in, the, uh, in the proximal osteal LED, and five millimeter squared in a stented circumflex. In Excel, we found that the optimal numbers were much higher. Mm -hmm. We found uh, almost 10 millimeters squared in the left mm -hmm. main. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we kept, bigger is better. Bigger is That's always right. better, but it seemed like the plateau started to occur at about 10 to 10 and a half millimeters. Okay. So. All right, I, I, I believe that one. Even in the you know, FFL cutoff values, it's a, depending on a body mass index or yes, size yes. wise, uh, I think uh, I agree a little bit different. Uh, however, um, main bifurcations, a practical issue, I, I got some little bit different. Yeah. To be honest, in the, uh, uh, we started 40%, just like you, you know, we okay. got uh, too much, 40% to stand, you know, right. proportions. However, if we determine you know, by uh, functions, I was, okay, there is some disease and circumflex osteum, and so we didn't approach provisional stand for the, the main bifurcation, mm -hmm. right? It's a big arteries, and so for the safety concerns, we don't make it, you know, more it's a complicated mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. the stand, you know, dewiring, something like that. And so we have predetermined, you know, understanding of what the disease status. We do just a two stand, mm -hmm. no hesitation. Right, and right. so we didn't do concept of a provisional stand for the remain is mm -hmm. the only reason why the big one and the two stand or just three bit wrong. <laughs> All right, but provisional one. is probably worse. Provisional, if you have to stand, is probably worse than <laughs> upfront right, right. stand. Exactly for just we discussed in yeah. the uh, yesterday the diffuse DD. There right. are some circumflex DDs. We don't have too much you know yeah. uh, concern. They're just the stand and balloon crossing and two right. stand right. And high pressure inflation, effective stand area is more than yeah. five, six, as it doesn't mean. And that's good, as we can make a good clinical outcome. And so uh, I would say, even in the LAD diagonal bifurcation, if the, just Antonio mm -hmm. mentioned about the size matters, as a big yeah. vessel, we want to do the two stands. So, so I think that's <laughs> the key, and we're running out of time, but I think that if you're going to do two stands, especially mm -hmm. an important bifurcation, mm -hmm. your technique has to be meticulous, and you mm -hmm. have to optimize the geometry of the carina mm -hmm. and get the most, mo the largest and most circular, mm -hmm. in this case, osteal circumflex yeah. and proximal mm -hmm. circumflex mm -hmm. result. So there's, we don't have time to discuss it. It's controversial. There's randomized trials about mm -hmm. this. There's uh, a fair amount of evidence that suggests DK crush mm -hmm. may be the best way to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Other people don't believe that and think other techniques <laughs> right. can be very good. We need more studies. Right. The DCB concept is very, very interesting. We're struggling in the United States now, as you know, mm -hmm. with increased mortality and peripheral DCB use. Uh, which is a real issue right now. We have very little data on native coronary DCB use. We need more data and randomized trials in that regard. Great. But I think that uh, we still have a lot more to learn, but we're making tremendous progress over the last uh, three decades of PCI mm -hmm. with treating left main and complex multivessel disease. Great. So I want to thank uh, John Ormiston, Antonio Colombo, mm -hmm. and always my I'm, friend I'm, SJ right. for it's a really fascinating session, that. amazing right. TCTAP, and we hope you've enjoyed this wrap-up interview. I'm Greg Stone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.